totally looking to the next segment. Looking forward. <laughs> I love being with the family. Just, I love being able to just pour out my heart. You know, I, regardless of where I'm at, I'm always going to pour out my heart in worship. I could be driving down the road, and you might see me one of these days just
Not, that might be that might be dangerous. Okay. So I don't think there's anyone here that doesn't know when it's appropriate to say maybe you don't know, Chuck, that Curtis has decided decided to retire to uh, to uh, uh, not so much leave us here at Redding Community Church, but forego being the pastor. Okay. And his desire is very particularly worse, is that he doesn't read Redding and he doesn't really become uninvolved in, in RCC, but he stay here, worship with us, and occasionally teach, okay? Um, and that will be a process, and the process starts this week. Um, uh, along with that, we want to sort of an associated thing, is that Curtis has served here for uh, 20 years, and we try to figure out how to honor him for that at the same time he's saying about seven down. So we do have a fun going, if you're so inclined, to uh, send him off to Bandit for a couple of days of golf. Okay, so uh, that, we thought that was pretty good. You know? and, uh, uh, he, he maintains his probably one of the premier horse so they got a picture of up there. Uh, horses in, in the country. So anyhow, if, we're, if you want to show up, we have, the question is, we have Tom over there. It's Tom over there. So, so we had to figure out what to do about uh, uh, Tom. Tom had to figure out what to do about us. <laughs> I'm not sure if he was looking back favorably in Ohio or not. Or uh, I don't think so. And uh, so at, after considering that, uh, both, uh, you know, in, in the, what I say this morning, you know, Tom wants to know what he's getting into, and the church wants to know what they're getting into. Uh, we're we're um, sort of adapting a different strategy, and we're going to interview Tom first, and uh, that process. That process goes on. Give the, ch the church a chance uh, to chat with Tom and, uh, and, and make up our mind whether, uh, through the assistance of the Holy Spirit, we'll uh, uh, call it Tom here. So uh, that process begins and, uh, actually this week uh, with, our, with our first meeting. And you know, we, you know how much, if you know me very well, you know how much I love meetings. Anyway, uh, Bill Curtis just for that. Anyway. Um, Okay, other elder business is we have two, uh, two candidates uh, to join the elder board. And uh, uh, one is Matt White, our first youth pastor, and he, he's not here, and most of you know him. The other is uh, Gary McPherson, who, uh, who, who already went through this the first service, but uh, Gary and Joyce uh, have stayed, and this is Gary and his wife Joyce. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, we're going to we're going to introduce them to you as recommended by the elder board, and the vote will take place in early August. Okay. And if you want to know information about them, you can talk to them. I mean, I think they're probably not going to be your day of service, but on the flip side, uh, there's a bio out front, and they're and they're fairly regulars. So um, let me let me think of the other announcements that are written up here. And, you know, I will say something else to get myself in trouble with Tom. But, uh, this, this is what the bios look like. They're out front, okay? Casual group. Uh, Tom's message this, this morning is on teachers. You know, that they my brother with them. And I was kidding Joyce between the service. I'll tell this to Chuck, too. Because they haven't been with us very long. They had settled into a fairly comfortable existence in their home, with their rental home in a beautiful California community called Paradise. And they had been there for many years, in fact. And, and one morning, uh, when, was a year and a half ago now? One morning, a year and a half ago, of course, uh, changed their whole outlook and future. So I told Tom that, you know, uh, talk about deterrence you know, in life. And you've had a few too, John. So uh, uh, you guys should talk, okay? Chuck, Chuck and I got our gray hair together. Is that that sort of? <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll rush through these. The women at noon on Saturday, we're having a, a, a luncheon for all women. If they may be doing Bible study, it's in the yard at the house. So uh, show up if you bring your lunch. And, uh, you bring your own lunch, and you can bring a chair if you've got one. And if it's maybe too warm, uh, maybe I'll let you come over here and do this in the mountains. Uh, but anyhow, it's a noon on Tuesday, uh, over at the house in the yard. The, um, 
Uh, Friday, there's a community-wide uh, worship service, uh, music service, and it's going to be a highland at 7 o'clock, and everybody is welcome. Uh, if you, uh, it, it does say Women's Night of Worship, if you look carefully, it says live community worship, so everybody can come. Uh, and uh, as I said, if you don't want to uh, attend in person, you can listen to the um, uh, Worship 24-7, which is also known as 93 or 7. And then finally, there's an American Cancer Society walk in Pineville this Saturday. It lasts all day long. Uh, if you're so inclined to, uh, to uh, support the uh, American Cancer Society, this is the only walk this year. And it's going to be community uh, wide walks. And we'll get you more information on that. If you're, uh, yeah, if you're a walker and you want to support them. So why don't we just take a moment and go to prayer and uh, continue our worship. Gracious Father, as we, as we come in to this building this morning, as in doing that, we are just a portion of your, your church, which seeks in this day, in this country, to, uh, in many ways and in many forms, to gather together and honor your Son. May you bless us with your presence and your guidance. May your Spirit, Lord, move amongst us. May it be with all the churches, Lord, that honor and seek you, and seek me through your Son and through your Word. So, uh, so be with Tom this morning as he uh, as he comes before us and he brings the wisdom of your Word and and, uh, and uh, his heartfelt message from the Spirit uh, to encourage us through our our work and our walk for you. And uh, be with our church, Lord, as they seek to uh, to find an under shepherd for this uh, for this local group, and that you might be. Uh, fully involved in that process and honored by it. And also be with the, the election of elders and leaders of this body, Lord, as, a, as we decide and also as we uh, seek your wisdom uh, through the years to build up your portion of the people that are here. So be with us throughout this morning and this hour in your son's name we pray. Amen. You know, normally they, the, the early service is, is, is kind of uh, uh, my... Preacher, me. <laughs> um, as we were just in worship, I was just just sensing the Lord, and uh, I want to kind of flip the script a little bit, and I, I want to just kind of share and, and talk with you a little bit this morning. It's interesting that, you know, as Mike was, was kind of talking about it, and this is sort of impromptu, it's kind of off uh, where we're going as in this whole process uh, a lot of questions have come to me um, just about the call. And as I just kind of look back and reflect and, and, and think on some things, uh, and maybe I've said it to this body, you know, from this place, or just kind of in passing, um, when I was 14 years old, I had two dreams. One was that I would play professional basketball. You know, I had Jordan up on the wall and Magic Johnson, and uh, I, I, was, I, was, I was like, yeah, I could, I, I could do that. At least try it for a little bit. And the other was to be a pastor. Was, and if I look at life, I go, wow, it's been kind of crazy a little bit. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you a little bit about, and I'm going to give you the title uh, right from the beginning, and then we're going to kind of go into some text and, and look at a story and, and pull some things out. The title of the message this morning is called Detours, to destiny, detours to destiny. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me because we want to just, you know, jump into the Lord's Word and kind of flesh some things out. And we're going to be in the 13th chapter of the book of Exodus. So 
The book of Exodus is, is you know, kind of a, a chronicling of the children of Israel's life out of bondage in Egypt. And, and I'm going to use some terms. I'm going to kind of flip back and forth so we have these. Uh, I'm going to talk about deliverance. So Egypt rec uh, represents the place that they needed to be delivered from. And then Canaan land was the promise, and that's destiny. So Exodus is, is kind of chronicling the children of Israel's journey from deliverance to destiny. And we want to look at verse 17 of chapter 13, and we're going to look at 17 and 18 because uh, there are some things in here uh, that I think not only I'm starting to, to really get and see in my life, but some of us, you know, with COVID craziness and pandemonium and all of this stuff, you could probably feel the same thing. So verse 17 reads this. It says, Now when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. Now, we're going to flesh this out more, but I want you to be, to be thinking about that. Destiny or deliverance to destiny rarely follows a straight line. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> Deliverance to destiny very rarely follows a straight line. So we see right here immediately in the text, he says he didn't lead them by the way of the Philistines, although it was near. It was a straighter line. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. You're probably going, okay, and is there more? Sure, there's a lot more. But what we have here really starts to explain why God uses detours to take us to destiny. How many of us remember maps? Paper maps. Anybody remember maps? And one of the most frustrating, or maybe it was just me I was frustrated, one of the most frustrating, I see some folk in the back and they're looking at me like, is maps like? They're looking at going, what's, 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 what's that? Like, you know, um, we actually used to have these paper things that laid out cities and states, and you actually had to look at them and point and follow and actually look at road signs. And now we got Siri, right? <laughs> but what was frustrating about maps? It was, well, not just opening the maps, but you know what was frustrating about maps? Huh? Couldn't close it, right? You couldn't close the maps, that was frustrating. What I hated about maps was I got, the, I got the route all figured out and I'm going along and I get someplace and the road's closed. Or the road's not there. Or I got a go around, and if you were by yourself, it was, it was a chips episode waiting to happen because you're trying to, you got your map up on the steering wheel and you're trying to drive and you're looking and you're trying to figure out where everything, anybody remember that other than, right? So, so we got, now we got Siri, and Siri will just redirecting, right? How many people still get upset when you gotta be redirected. <laughs> I'm still mad. It's like, no, Siri, I want to go there. Redirecting. <laughs> Redirecting. Right? No, I want to go there. And that's life. It's, it's, it's a lot like life. You know, uh, when I think about, you know, just my life, there have been so many times when I literally was like, oh, yeah, baby. This is like open the chute. 
here we go, straight line, and I'm hopping along, and God goes, redirecting. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I, I, I don't, I don't want a redirection. I want to go there. Redirecting. This year, I had pursued something that, you know, if, if you know kind of a lot about my other life, law enforcement and the training, I'd, I'd pursued something. And when me and the missus, when we, when we sat and uh, kind of looked at everything, I kid you not, we were like, oh my goodness, this has got God's hands all over it. It was perfect. It was, it was what I was designed to do. I thought it was what I had been doing for 20 years. I'm fairly good at it. And I go through the process. And it didn't happen. Redirecting. We love, when, when we talk about God, there are some things about God that we get really excited about. You know, I love looking at God as a way maker. How many of you know that God is a way maker? We go, I love the fact that God is a way maker. And you know, if you grew up in the black church, you get even crazy. And he'll make a way out of no way. And he's the bomb in Gilead. And, he, oh, and we go crazy. Oh, yes, praise him, Lord. Praise him. Yes, he'll take something and make nothing and nothing and make something. And he'll flip it and flop it and turn it. And we love it. We, we, we like those things about God. It, we, we are drawn to the fact that out of everyone that is in our lives, God, the scripture says, his character is immutable. It's a fancy way for saying he does not change. We love it. God does not change. But when we hit a detour, we have a problem. When we hit a detour in our life, especially when we look at things and we think, oh my goodness, this is God. And then we hit a detour God reveals something about him that's a little bit harder for us to deal with, and that is that God can be unpredictable. Mm, see, I didn't get no hallelujahs out of that. No, everybody was like, no, let's go back to black church. Let's go back to Jesus' way maker. He'll make a way out of no way. Let's say he doesn't change. We want that one. We don't want unpredictable. Now, I want you to hear this. Unpredictability is not code for me throwing shade on God. God is completely faithful. God is completely reliable. God is completely consistent. So when we look at things in our lives, sometimes there's this, there's this, this rub because we look at the consistency of his character and we don't know how to reconcile the unpredictability in his activity. Oh, see, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. <laughs> the reason many of us have not been utterly destroyed during this pandemic is because God doesn't change. The reason some of us have not been ground into dust is because he's completely reliable. 
The reason many of us have not been just torn apart or we haven't torn people apart is because God is completely faithful. But what do I do when I run into his unpredictability? You know, you look at scripture and there are so many places where sometimes Jesus, he healed people by touching them. And then sometimes he healed with a word. Completely unpredictable. Sometimes healing was immediate. Sometimes he waited. Completely consistent in his character. Completely consistent in his character. Yet he can be unpredictable in how he works. And why don't we like that? We don't like waiting. Anybody in here, and, and it's okay because this is church and we're family and we should be allowed to do it. How many of you are control freaks? <laughs> we, we, don't like, we don't like God's unpredictability because what it requires is that we relinquish control. And, 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 and I heard another preacher say it this way. It's really not even that we have control. We must relinquish what we perceive as control because we really don't have any control at all. God is so amazing because he will interrupt our lives to get us exactly where he needs us to be. You guys are going to leave today and you're going to be out walking around and you're going to send redirecting. So when we look at scripture, there's some amazing there are some amazing stories where we can see the complete consistency of God's character, but then he confounds and confuses us with how he operates. Chapter 11 of the book of John, we run into this cat named Lazarus. <clears throat> and in around verse 4, it says that Jesus loved Lazarus and his sisters. And Jesus gets word, and he is walking distance away, that Lazarus is sick and dying. And the sisters say, Jesus, come, holler at your boy. And Jesus says, no, nah, I think I'm going to hang out here about two more days. Because, see, the Sadducees had a teaching that said that a man's spirit actually left his body after three days. So Jesus said, I'm going to wait, foe, because I want to make sure he good and dead. So that when I show up, there is no question. And we know what happened. He shows up and he raises Lazarus from the dead. Completely consistent in his character. His loving, healing, saving character. Completely consistent. But he was unpredictable. Because the sisters are arguing with him. They're like, hey, if you would have showed up, our brother wouldn't have died. But see, they had gotten accustomed to him being healer. And what did he have to show them? He had to show them that I'm not only healer, but I'm resurrector. But if I don't make a detour, you'll only know me one way. Joseph, 17-year-old bratty boy, gets this dream that he's going to be something. It's going to be something. And he ends up being sold into slavery and then he ends up doing a, such a good job that he's head of the household of the number two person. And then he gets lied on. And then he gets thrown in prison. And then he gets forgotten. And I'm thinking, if I'm Joseph the whole time, I would be like, 
uh, I, man, I thought, I thought I heard that right. I thought I heard that God had a plan for my, how many of you have been sitting around going, I thought God really had a plan for my, I mean, I'm going to just raise my hand. Because there are times when I'm like, God, I thought I heard you right. I thought I had, got a plan. You had a plan for my life. And this don't look nothing like the plan. Redirecting. So these two verses are about a detour. And if we go into the story, if we listen to the, if, we, if you read the story, this is really a conversation that God is having between him and Moses. And he says, hey, we're going to go to Pharaoh and we're going to tell him, let my people go. And I'm going to deliver you. He made a promise. I'm going to deliver you and I'm going to take you to destiny. And Moses is like, cool, we in. And he goes to Pharaoh, let my people go. And we know that ultimately lets the people go. But then we read the text. Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. Uh, if I'm Moses, I'm like, uh, uh, I'm sorry, God, I'm not one to complain. But uh, during our convo, um, I, I, I don't recall anything about the wilderness. Um, God, um, uh, during our convo, I don't rem remember anything uh, about losing my job. Um, God, uh, 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 during the convo, I don't remember anything about losing a child, a spouse. Um, I don't remember anything about my health failing. So what do I do? What do we do? What do you do when we're caught in a detour. When it's not on the map, it's not, it's not on the map, what do we do? See, we don't like detours. We don't like detours. I don't like them. <laughs> it goes against my control freak nature. Um, maybe this isn't good to tell him, Pastor Mike. Yeah, I'm sort of that guy sometimes. I don't like anything that I don't control. See, we see detours as setbacks to destiny. God uses detours as seasons of development. We see detours as setbacks to destiny. I was talking to some friends just about, you know, me pursuing this call. And they say, well, they said, you do a lot of different things. And I said, no, I do one thing a lot of different ways. <laughs> God made me one way. I just do it a lot of different ways. So why don't we like detours? Detours delay us. We want it now. How many people are like Burger King? We want it our way, right? We, I want it now. I want it my way. Um, you know, I tried that. You know, Burger King, uh, I went to Burger King when you could go to Burger Well, you can still go to Burger King, but I don't go to Burger King very much. But I would go to Burger King, and I would ask them. I would say I'd order all this food, and I would say, and I would like it free because that's my way. And they, no, they were like, no, no, you're actually the burger joker, so you're not the burger king. But we don't like delays because we want it now. We don't like delays because they frustrate us. 
We don't, we don't understand. How many of you have ever been in a traffic jam and you literally are trying to do this through your windshield? What in the world is going on up there? <laughs> right? Come on. All of us been in the car. You're laughing because everybody's been in the car. It's like, well, it's like six miles up the road. What in the world? Right? Because we want to we wanna know. We don't like detours because detours remind us that we are not in control. Whenever we get redirected, we are reminded that we are not in control. But you see, God uses detours as seasons of development. So whenever God uses the detour, the detour is always about our development. He is either trying to get something in us or he is trying to get something out of us. Now, let's go back into the text and, and kind of look at this. It says, he didn't lead them by the way of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said, the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So, you know, God knows, he knew, what does he know about Canaan land? He knows that in Canaan land, they're going to have to fight. But they have been slaves for 400 years, so they don't think like soldiers. So God goes, if I take them through a place where they actually encounter war, it might frighten them, and they'll turn back and want to be slaves. Sometimes God will not tell you what you're getting into because if he did, you would run for the hills. <laughs> Sometimes we got to cut off attitudes. I heard a guy say this and it just blew my mind because I'm thinking about myself in this process. I told my wife the other day, I said, man, I hope I can you know, be true to God's word and give the people something I just don't know. And she goes, what are you talking about, man? Our life is detour. <laughs> it's detour. I heard a pastor say this. Sometimes it's not the enemy. It's the inner me. Let that one settle. Sometimes God's got to take us on a detour because you have attitudes and ways that you think that if he put you in destiny right now, you would not be able to hold on to it. Your attitude would wreck it. So he takes you on a detour to develop you. Sometimes... God takes you on a detour, and this is a tough one, because sometimes we need people removed from our lives. Good, good morals can be corrupted by bad company. Hear that. Good morals can be corrupted by bad company. Scripture says that if you hang out with wise men, you become wise. But if you hang out with fools, you can suffer folly. If you just hang out with fools, you can suffer. So sometimes the detour is designed to cut people off of you. And sometimes God is trying to get certain things in you. Last week, we talked a little bit about who you are. And sometimes on these detours, God 
is reaffirming every single day who you are so that when you get to your destiny, people praising you doesn't move you. People tearing you down doesn't move you. I listened to Will Smith. He had a talk on. My wife shared it with me, and I was listening to it, and some people asked Will. They said, uh, you know, man, shame on you for, like, bringing up your, your kids in uh, Hollywood. And he was like, what? He was like, I was raised in Philly. <laughs> Hollywood, that's easy. You mean a couple people don't like what you do, and they take to social media about it? Sometimes the detour is about getting stuff in you so that you know completely who you are. So the question is this. Do you only trust God with what he has done? Um, I got to pause for dramatic effect. Do you only trust God with what he has done? Or do you trust him with what he will do? See, that's, that's an important one. Because when, when I'm in a detour, I'm like, but, 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 but. And it's like, God is going, do you trust that we're still going to destiny. So Pastor Tom, what do we do when we're in destiny? The only thing that you and I have control over, if we have control over anything, we have control over two things. And if you're taking notes, you'll want to write this down. There are only two things that we have control over. We have control over our responsibility and I divide responsibility into two words, our ability to respond, and we have, respond, or we have control over our influence. That's it. So when we're in seasons of detour, what do we do? And I want us to look at just a couple things. So when we're in these seasons of detour, Seasons of detour are times when God does what we don't expect. That's a detour. God does what we don't expect. If you are ever going to go anywhere with God, you must get comfortable operating in the unexpected. You have to get comfortable operating in the unexpected. The children of Israel are wandering through the wilderness, and they like, we hungry. We hungry. We want some bread. And scripture says that from heaven came cornflakes. Cornflakes from heaven. They said, we want some bread. And they wake up in the morning and there is this stuff on the ground, and, and it looked like coriander seed, and, and they're like, and they called it manna. And do you know literally what manna means? What is it? That's literally what manna means. What is it? That's what it means. What is it? Because they said, we want some bread, and they woke up in the morning, and there was cornflakes on the ground. They said, what is that? They said, what, 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 is, what is that? Hey, hey, God, I, 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 need a new, I need a new job. And he says, hey, go work for this person for free. What is that? <laughs> hey, God, I, I, I want to be more loving. And he just bring a whole bunch of just contrite, just busted people. And you're like, what is that? Right? We have got to get comfortable operating in seasons of the unexpected. I wasn't going to share this, but I'm going to share this. I believe that the unexpected is the raw material of the supernatural. It's the raw material of the supernatural. 
We have to get comfortable dealing with these seasons where God is doing something that we don't expect. Detours are seasons or times when God establishes himself as your source. If we remember the story, if we remember the story, how did God tell them to behave with the manna? Take only what you need for the day. Take only what you need for the day. If you try to take more than that, what's going to happen to it? It's spoiled. The only time he gave them more was what? Before the Sabbath because they couldn't work, so he gave them enough for two days. He wants to establish himself as your source. So when we're in these seasons of detour... Come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. How many of us are surviving simply because God is our source? You have many resources. You only have one source. Many resources. So he says, hey, I got you. To, you got to get this right in the times of detour when I'm developing you, what I'm trying to get in you is that I am your source because when you get to destiny, there are things that you're asking me for in development. When we're in the wilderness, there are things that you're asking me for that you will have an overabundance of when you get to destiny. And if you don't have this relationship right, You'll forget me when you get to destiny. So in detours, we have to see God as our source. And detours are about seasons. They're, they're designed to be moments. Detours are about moments. I was praying into this and, and, and as I was, you know, just kind of laying things out, this fell into my spirit. How we handle ourselves on the detour determines the length of delay. How we handle ourselves in the detour determines the length of delay. Even though he didn't take them the straight path, the journey was supposed to take like 11, 12, 14 days. It ended up being 40 years because they mismanaged the detour. How many of us I'm going to just ask a direct question. How many of us feel like we're in a season where God is disappointing us? <laughs> God, in our convo, I saw two places. I saw where you were taking me from and I saw where you were taking me to. And now I'm out here in the wilderness. I don't, I don't understand it. Here's what I want to encourage you, and sometimes that's a hard one because we don't, we don't always want to Get mad at God. I've been mad at God. I don't understand this detour. I thought we were going from here to here.
I know as I sit in this personal process myself, he's been peeling back the onion a little bit. And he said, do you see why you had to go through that? Because I need you to be able to hang on to this when I give it to you. So if you feel like, man, maybe God is disappointing me, he's letting me down somehow, you may be on a detour. Detours aren't bad. Detours aren't bad. See, God never wants to set us up for failure. And if he takes us right from deliverance to destiny, and I got to be a warrior, but I'm thinking like a slave, I won't survive in the land of destiny. I saw this quote. It said, difficult roads lead to the most beautiful destinations. Difficult roads. Uh, it's great in Central Oregon. You'll get into some of these places and you'll follow some of these crazy trails and then all of a sudden it opens up into the most magnificent places. But the road would suggest that there's nothing beautiful through there. When I look at the seasons of my life, I only have one logical response to God. I trust you. Philippians 1.6 says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. So if you feel like you're on a detour, no, that's not the end of your story. He's developing you to be able to live in your destiny well. Amen? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you're our Lord, our guide, our Savior, our Heavenly Father, and that, Father, you see things that we don't see. And while in our spiritual misunderstanding or immaturity, we would want the destiny now, your plans are perfect, and you're constantly developing us to be able to live in destiny and live in it well. Father, I pray that your word takes root today that your people know exactly who you are and that they can look back and even when they see what might be described as unpredictable, they have no other option but to completely trust you because you're totally reliable. You know where each of us is and you're constantly redirecting us for your glory and our good. We thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen.